wasn't it gorgeous? The sun was shining, and there was that beautiful fog in with the trees, and it, it just looked like a, I don't know, some type of picturesque painting on the way in, at least from the north. But if you'd open your bulletins as we get started here, I've got a couple of announcements. First, I want to thank everyone that showed up last night. It was fantastic. The meal was great. The decorations were great. Dawn and Diana, I have to thank you for all your assistance. And then I, I need to say thank you uh, to Susan and Janet. And, and if Megan was here, I'd thank Megan. I know we got to drag her out. Yeah. But they had the church looking nice. So thank you, ladies, for helping to decorate the, the church, the sanctuary, keeping everything looking nice. We are going to be participating in helping the Salvation Army ring the bells, the kettle drive. We're looking at two dates. It's going to be Friday, the 15th of December, and the 16th, which is a Saturday of December. We're going to be ringing at County Market, and it starts from I don't know, 10 to 7 o'clock is the last sign-up sheet, so it's over at 8. But there's a sign-up in the foyer. If you're willing to help us ring, Please sign up. It's in one hour increments. You can sign up for multiple spots if you're willing to ring. But that, once again, it's going to be the 15th and the 16th of December. We're going to be ringing at the county market, and it start, goes from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. So feel free to sign up and help out. Also, another announcement is who has heard of the movie I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day? It's, it's uh, by Sight, uh, Sight and Sound Theater. It's actually going to be at the Guthrie Theater on December the 8th, and it's free by the Tower Church. So if you haven't seen that movie, it is a good movie about uh, Longfellow, the, the gentleman who penned the words to I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. So it's at the Guthrie Theater. The showing starts at 7, doors open at 6. But the Tower Church went on ahead and supplied it, so it's open to the public. So that was the last announcement. Any other announcements that need to be made? All right, at this time, if you would stand, and join me for an opening word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. Father, we're so thankful for everything you've done for us. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ, who came to die on the cross for our sins. Father, right now, we just... Quiet our hearts, and we just invite you into our presence, Father. We just ask that your, your spirit would just settle upon this sanctuary. Keep our hearts open to what your spirit has to say, Father, and keep us focused. Help us from being distracted by what's going on around us. We love you, and we praise you. And all these things we just ask in Jesus' heavenly name. Amen. You may be seated. Would you just continue to quiet your hearts as we listen to this song? Let's look at our bulletin and read the scripture together. 
These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Tremendous uh, verse of scripture for us to share together this morning. All right, let's look on the screen and sing that chorus that you sang a couple weeks ago, Jesus is the Joy of Living.
something this morning. I was up early, and I had all the time in the world, had everything together, but I kept on, there's a couple things I kept on forgetting. One of the things is, Brother Joe Jakuma sent us a letter, and I wanted to read it, and I forgot it, I, I apologize, church. But, <laughs> Brother Joe, so for those that are visiting, we, we helped raise some funds to help build a church over in Nigeria. And Brother Joe just sent a really nice letter thanking us. Uh, he, he still is just in shock. But they were just telling us that he's been looking, they've been looking at some land over there, and they're about ready to make a purchase. They think everything works out. So let's continue to pray for them that there's no roadblocks or anything like that while they go forward with the plan of building the church. Uh, I just, Christina, you're going to have to like help me remember that next week, okay? <laughs> She has enough to do. You know. You've heard that we have you know, another child. Well, I'm, I'm the fifth child, too, I guess you could say. But, all right, at this time, if the ushers would come forward for the tithes and offering, just thank you once again for how much you've been blessing the church. We really appreciate it. And uh, all glory goes to God. We know. All glory goes to God. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we come before you. Once again this morning, Father, we just thank you for how you've been blessing us. We thank you for how you've been blessing this church. And Father, now I just ask that you would bless this tithes, Father, that you bless the offering, bless the gift and the giver, Father, and use it to further your kingdom. We praise you, Father. All glory to you. All these things we ask in Jesus' heavenly name. Amen.
and Jane. Thank you. 
this time, if you would stand. <laughs> Us, 
in this sanctuary right now, Father, that you just help us to be a light in the darkness around us. Father, I think of the, the kettle drive that's going on with the Salvation Army. Father, I just ask that you be with that outreach. Father, that you would just bless the those that are going to give to it. Bless those that are working it. Father, just give the Salvation Army administration wisdom as they utilize those funds, Father. Because they are trying to spread your word, Father. I just ask that you just anoint them. <laughs> Father, I pray that you be with us the rest of this service. Have your way in it. We give it all to you. All glory, honor, and praise belongs to you and you alone. We love you and we praise you. And all these things we ask in Jesus' heavenly name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
can mean a spontaneous or natural liking or sympathy for someone or something. Or listen to this definition. A similarity of characteristics suggesting a relationship, especially a resemblance in structure. Having an affinity for God. Alrighty. Who here ever took uh, chemistry? So we're going to do, bear with me. I'm sorry, Marilyn. <laughs> so here, this is salt, sodium chloride. Okay, now, now it'll, it'll make sense here in a little bit. Sodium chloride. So you see, you got a little bit of a positive over here and a little negative. It's, think of it as a magnet. You got the two ends of the magnet, right? You remember playing with the magnets as a child. You try to make the, the two positive ends touch and they're pushing away. But if you flip it around, the negatives, they, they suck together, right? Okay, so we're talking about salt maintaining its saltness. We, we want this salt to maintain the charge to each other. Okay. But that, that is H2O, water. Okay, that, that's your regular water ion or molecule. Now, the thing with water that some people don't realize is water is what's called a polar molecule. It has one end of it has this positive charge near the hydrogen. The other, the other has this negative charge near the oxygen. So... What happens is, just like the sodium chloride, sodium's a little bit more positive, chloride's a little bit more negative, well, what happens is that oxygen will get over towards the, the sodium and start pulling it away. And, and, and you think if there's just one molecule, it's not that bad. But when salt is dumped into water, it is surrounded, and here we go again, Lori, this isn't... Hmm. Well, anyways, it's surrounded by all these water molecules. It's surrounded by all these water molecules, and so what starts happening is the sodium and that chloride get pulled apart because they get distracted by the molecules that are floating around them. All of a sudden, that sodium starts getting attracted to the oxygen and leaves the, the chlorines getting attracted to the hydrogen part of the, 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 the water molecule and starts getting pulled apart because of the distractions that are going on around them in the atmosphere that they are in. Okay, so we might revisit this. Maybe not. This is interesting. Batteries will charge, supposedly. Uh, well, we're, yeah, we're just going to go like this, old-fashioned way. So, what I want us to do is, we've been in the book of Daniel, talking about retaining the salt. We're going to turn to Daniel chapter 6, and as you see there, it's verse 1 through 28. Don't worry, we're not going to read all 28 verses, maybe 26. But where we are is Daniel just got done interpreting the dream, or the handwriting on the wall. Remember the handwriting on the wall? It occurred in chapter 5, and, and, and Daniel just got done interpreting it, and then King Darius came in and took over. So King Darius now, well, actually, we might as well start reading in, in verse 1 of chapter 6. It says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom and 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the prince might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Kind of sounds a little bit like Moses when Moses was leading the children out of Israel. There's so many people that he started, you know, putting, hey, you take over this tribe, you take over that tribe. So that's really what Darius was doing, is just kind of fighting up his kingdom a little bit. Verse 3. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and the princes, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find none occasion nor fault. For as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. I'll pause here for a second. You see what it said in verse 3? It said, because an excellent spirit was in him. If you can click the advance just once. See, 
We know that Daniel had an established relationship with God. In verse 3, we see that as a result of that, he had an excellent spirit within him. And the, here's the ironic thing, or the interesting thing. The world recognized it. The world saw that. Remember those princes and the other presidents that didn't like Daniel? They knew that something was different about him. And here's the other thing. is They knew that Daniel was close with God because in verse 5 it says... Then these men, they said that we shouldn't find, we can't find anything wrong with him. We can't find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. See, they already they knew Daniel well enough that they knew that Daniel had God first. And here's the interesting thing too: the world will notice that we're different, and usually it causes them to do two things. One, either they'll, they'll say, I want what you got. Tell me about God. Tell me about Jesus. Or two, they're going to attack you. In Daniel's situation, they started to attack him. They couldn't stand him. They, they, they wanted to do something to find fault. Because they were jealous of where he was. They were jealous where he was. Let's continue reading here. I just want to read verse 7. Because what we see here is all the presidents, all the princes, all the other administration got together and they were brainstorming. And in verse 7 we see, All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. You see, these men got together and decided the only way is if we get him on his God. And so they, they approached the king, Darius. And remember, Darius was not a Christian at all. He was aware, but he wasn't a Christian at all. And they told the king, hey, king, what if we put out this rule that you can't pray to anyone, you can't talk to any other deity except for you? For the next 30 days. How does that sound? Well, the, to the king, he thought, hey, that, that makes me sound pretty important. I, 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 I don't see anything wrong with that. I don't see anything wrong with that at all. If you can advance the next. You see, what happened here is a distraction entered to interfere with the established relationship. See, Daniel had that established relationship with God, but now there's a distraction. Because that decree was signed. And Daniel knew about that decree. He knew that technically he shouldn't be praying to his God, to Yahweh. Going back to that chemistry slide, don't, don't go back to the chemistry slide, but going back to the, the salt slide, remember, the sodium and the chlorine, they were engaged. They were together. They were in an established relationship. But then what happens is all these outside distractions or attractions come on. And they start getting pulled apart because they are distracted. But this is what we need to see what happens next. So the king went on ahead and signed it. But let's look at verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, that decree... He went into his house, and his windows being open in his chambers toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his bed. Uh, he, he, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did before time. Look at that. He was resolved, and not only that. He openly sought after God, and he did it with diligence. Nothing changed. Nothing changed. Daniel did not change or shirk back at the, the, at the, at, at the thought of what that, that decree was. You know, he could have maybe justified and said, It's only 30 days. I think God would understand if I if I go 30 days without praying. I, I think God would forgive me if I go 30 days. He could have. And 
and, and the thing is, many individuals sometimes do that. Many individuals will say, well, maybe I can just take a break. Now, I won't pray to anyone else. I'm not going to pray to any idol or anything. But I'll just be quiet for a little bit. Or, or maybe what he could have done even is, instead of having his windows open, praying towards Jerusalem, which was his habit, he could have closed the doors and been in his inner room and kept it quiet and kept it secret that he was a follower of Christ, or a follower of God, excuse me, and praying. But he didn't do that. He didn't do that. He didn't allow the decree of the world to change his spiritual integrity. Right? You see, so many times <coughs> we allow the distractions of the world to come in between us and God. And it changes what our habits were. You see, Daniel was resolved. As I said, he could have said in his mind, 30 days, I could go 30 days without talking to God and I'd be okay. I'd save my own hide. Well, there's that common number that says, hey, it takes 21 days, right, to form a new habit. Well, some studies show that it could be as early as 18 days to form a new habit. So if Daniel would have gone 30 days without talking to God, what do you think that new habit would have been like? For us, sometimes things come up. And, 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 and we start, well, it's okay if, if I if I miss my devotions this morning because we're, we're getting up early, we're going in hunting. Or we're getting up early, we're going on a trip. Or, or I was up really late last night and I just needed to sleep in. It's okay if I don't have my alone time with God. Not saying that devotions have to be first thing in the morning, it could be last thing, it could be any, any time. Right? Oh, Christopher, just that. That's what <laughs> Meditate day or night, Scripture says in Joshua 1.8. But it can be any time of the day. But the thing is, Daniel was resolved. And he sought openly. And he did it with diligence. He could have hidden his relationship with God, closing the windows, but he didn't. You know, it, it's, it would have been common sense for anyone to say, hey, this decree went out, so obviously I'm not going to do it out in the open. I'm going to keep it to myself. But then what kind of witness is that? Is that a witness? Are we going to have an effect on those around us if we do that? I think of oftentimes when I've been at like a, a dinner party or something with at work a couple times. There's been a couple times where I'll just be like, hey, excuse me, just for one second. And I'll bless the food. You know, sometimes I've been with other individuals, though, that they, and I know that they're a believer, but they just feel awkward and, and hey, just give me a second. And, and so they just go on and eat like everyone else does. But there's an importance between blessing the food. Why? Well, let me show you why. Because if you bless the food, one, you're giving thanks to God. But two, it opens up a window of witnessing. Because someone might be like, why do you do that? And you're like, oh, let me tell you why I do that. And you can tell them about the salvation you have in Jesus Christ. So there's more than one reason why it's good to be open about your faith. Amen. We already have a testimony. Jen said that she was able to witness to the technician that came in to service the heater. Don't know how that got started, but it had to be because she had a living witness. She was open about her faith. Same thing, if we're to be salt of the earth, we need to be open about our faith as well. Right, amen. We need to be living it. We don't have to be like stuffing it down their throats because I tell you what, if God has changed you, and God is working in your life, they're going to be able to tell it. As we go back to verse 3, it says, because an excellent spirit was in him, the world's going to notice that there's something different. The world is going to notice that there's something different. That was it right there. Not shoving it down his throat. Yep. The world will notice something's different if you're living according to God's will. Verse 11. So these men, they assembled themselves. These, then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. That word supplication, the action of asking or begging for something earnestly or humbly. 
You see, these men, they, they knew that, and, and Daniel was a wise man. He knew that he was getting set up for a trap. He knew it. And so I guarantee you, his prayer was like, God, give me strength. God, give me strength. Help me not to yield to temptation. Give me strength. And these men, they saw him. Continuing in verse 12, it says, Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Has thou, not, has thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within thirty days, save thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which alter us not. Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee. O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, or maketh his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself, and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Side note. The king realized what he did. You see, the king liked Daniel. The, the, the king appreciated Daniel. But he was real hasty in his decision. You see, he allowed the influence of other people to come to him and say, hey, how would it sound if people only gave honor to you and only prayed to you? Doesn't that sound pretty good, king? I don't really think the king thought about it at all. I think he really just thought people praising me, giving honor to me, praying to me. Yeah, that sounds great. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that, that sounds great. Rash decisions wreak so much havoc. And this king realized what he did immediately. And you saw where it says, until the sun went down, he was trying to figure out, how can I save this, how can I save this man, Daniel? I love this guy. He's my right-hand man. How, how can I save him? But yet, the law of the Medes and the Persians can't be altered. So when we're making our choices, let's just remember every choice has a consequence and we have to be cognizant of that. Amen. Take it before God. Give it to God. Now, am I saying you need to pray before, okay, do I want Pepsi or Coke? No. Because we should all be drinking water, right? I said that for my wife, okay? I used to be a Mountain Dewer. Now I just drink coffee. Hey, there you go, Ray. Red coffee, right? <laughs> Alrighty. Verse 16. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the lion's den, or the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. Okay. This is huge here. Because remember, back in verse 3, we see, because an excellent spirit was in him, the world saw what was in him. And remember I said it does, it does two things. One, someone's going to be like, hey, I want what you got. Two, they're going to attack you. Well, we see where people are attacking Daniel. But now look at what the king said. The king said this. Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. You see, he noticed God working in Daniel's life. I'm sure he's heard the stories of the fiery furnace of the three Hebrew children. I'm sure he heard the stories of the handwriting on the wall, the interpretations. But I'm, I'm sure he's heard of the mightiness of this God that Daniel was serving. And so what the king said is he acknowledged it. Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. The king was aware of Daniel's fervor and devotion to God. It had to be the result of knowing and sensing that spirit that was within him. Not only that, but he had to have seen how religious Daniel was, how resolved Daniel was in his prayer life, in his devotional life. He had, it was that living witness that Daniel had. It was that difference. He acknowledged him here. So, what about the people that we work with? What about our coworkers? Those that we go to school with? Our neighbors, those within our neighborhood, are they able to sense that about us? The interaction that they have with us, are they able to sense that there's something different? 
Do they, are they able to sense that we serve God? Just, just think about those things. Think about it. Because remember, this all boils down to, that could be another chemistry pun, it all comes back to being salt and having an effect on people. So the people who are around, are they noticing? You see, and the thing is, too, in all of this, there's some people that they have a holier-than-thou outlook, or this holier-than-thou attitude. I guarantee you, well, I can't say that because I don't know, but I'm 99% sure Daniel was not like that. Because I can almost sense that Daniel almost had a, a little bit of a friendship relationship with, with Darius or, or the kings. Because you can see how Darius was so heartbroken at the result of needing to throw Daniel in the lines that so I don't think Daniel had a holier than thou. Instead, I think he had uh, uh, an attitude full of grace and mercy and loving kindness. Continuing along in verse 17. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Remember that rash decision? It will cause you to lose sleep. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when the king and when he came to the den, he cried with a lament voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, there it goes again, there's that phrase, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? Then Daniel said unto the king, O king, live forever. I get chills when I read that. Just because it's just this climax that's building up. You can see the king there is racing. He, he hasn't slept all night. It's almost like the opposite of the, the old Christmas day where you're, the kids are up all night because they just can't wait to open up the presents to you know, see what they got. Instead, you have King Darius who, I can't wait to see if God delivered Daniel. I can't wait to see if my, my friend's okay. And as soon as it got daylight, he took off like a flash just to see what happened. And he yelled, oh, Daniel, was your God able to deliver you from the lions? And he waited. And what did he hear? Daniel saying, O king, live forever. O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the mouths of the lions, that they have not hurt me. For as much before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt? Then was the king exceedingly glad for him, and commanded that they should take Daniel out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no manner of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. Continuing, dropping down to verse 25. Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion <laughs> shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and wonders in heavens and in earth. Who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? Daniel's devotion to God had a huge impact. It had a huge impact. Because you see, it had an impact where the king was able to recognize it. He says, the, he said, thy God is going to, the, the, the God whom thou servest is able to deliver thee from the lions. And he goes that morning and says, was he able to? And Daniel's like, yep. Yes, he was. So you see, Daniel's devotion to God had an impact on the king. But then it trickled down because the king made that decree again, saying, look at this. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before God of Daniel. So we see the, 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 the immediate of, of the witnessing going forth. 
But also, you can't ignore the fact that Daniel was spared from the lions. I mean, that, that, that's one of those, it's so obvious that sometimes you forget the impact of the devotion that Daniel had. Now, is that going to say that we are always going to live a life of prosperous if we devote ourselves to God? Well, listen to this. We talked about this in Sunday school. How do you measure prosperity? I can tell you how the world measures it. How does God measure prosperity? You see, the world is focused on this right here and right now. How God measures it is eternity. You know that verse, gain the whole world to lose his soul? You see, the world is going around crazy, taking up all the material things that they can, thinking that they're prospering or being prosperous. But I tell you what, there's going to come a day, a judgment day, when they're going to be standing before God. And if they don't have Jesus Christ in their heart, they're going to go to hell. Or there's going to be gnashing of teeth, torment, eternal. Does that sound like prosperity? No. On the other hand, you can have an individual who barely had two pennies to screw to rub together, but lived a life serving Christ. And what's going to happen on that day of judgment? Well, we've heard of the, the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. Well, when that individual goes to the judgment day, Jesus Christ is going to be like, oh, I've taken his sins. I've taken, I've taken his penalty of death. Let him come in. And he's going to be in heaven, eternal, celebrating with Christ, worshiping Christ, worshiping God. So, when you think of prosperity, let's think of it in the eternal <clears throat> sense. Yes, amen. So, in this case, with Daniel, God did save his life. His earthly life. But even if he did not save his earthly life, his devotion to God was still evident to those around him. Darius saw it. And so Darius put on a decree saying... <clears throat> Serve this, fear this God, fear this God. There's a Psalm 63, verse 1. It's a Psalm of David that David wrote while he was in the wilderness of Judah, and he was running. And look at this. It, it's, it's, I want you to remember this, this, this thought of keeping our eyes on Christ, or on God. Seeking God and, and seeking His will. It says, O oh God, Thou art my God. Early will I seek Thee. My soul thirsteth for Thee. My flesh longeth for Thee in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Do you hear the passion that David had? Do you see it? Early I will seek Thee. My soul is thirsting for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. You, you, you can just hear that, that supplication. You can just hear that, that longing of, God, I need you. I need more of you. I can't. I'm not content. We can never be content where we are. We always need to have more and more of God, more and more of Christ, more of the Holy Spirit within us. For you night owls, don't worry, i got a verse for you too. The next slide, verse 6 says this, When I remember thee upon my bed, and meditate on thee in the night watches. So that means in the night watches we can meditate. Meditate means to just, okay, you remember, who, who was all at the dinner last night? Yeah, yeah, okay, that roast beef, was that good? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and remember what you did. You, you, you savor that taste, right? You almost let it dissolve in your mouth. You're just chewing on it, tasting it, and you just like sal I'm making salivate now. Even. <laughs> but you're just chewing on it, right? And you're getting all that flavor and those juices out of it. That's what meditating is. You see, and meditate on thee in the night watches. That means you're not just letting things go in one ear and out the other ear. When you're reading or when you're praying, something that I gotta work on, I, I'm really bad at, and this is your passion making a confession. I'm really bad at just saying a quick prayer and then going on with the day. Versus taking 
good period of time to quiet my heart. That's what I love how we hear in the morning how we have that time set apart where we just quiet our hearts while the ladies are playing a song because it allows us to get rid of that distraction. It allows us to get in that proper focus and meditate on thee in the night watches. When we're reading, we let that verse just mull over again and again in our head. We're just chewing on that verse and, okay, God, what do you have for me in what I'm reading? Or what do you have for me in what I'm, in what I'm uh, praying about? And then we're listening. And then we're listening. Oh God, thou art my God, early I will seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee, in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. And verse 6 says, When I remember thee upon my bed, and meditate on thee in the night watches. You see, if you think back to that image of that sodium chloride, that, that, that chemical, that, that molecule there, the ion, they get pulled apart, but if they stay close, and if they stay focused on each other, it's harder to pull them apart. There are actually some bonds that almost cannot be broken. Some of those molecular bonds that cannot be broken. How's your bond with God? How's your bond with Jesus Christ? With the Holy Spirit? Can you go to the next slide there, Marie? As we finish up. Do you have an established relationship with God? That's the first thing is, we need to have an established relationship with God. Amen. Daniel had that established relationship with God. We know that. Because it says that he continued to pray as he has done in the past. Is another word that could be said. He had an established relationship. And we know he had an established relationship because there's the other five chapters of Daniel. He had an established relationship. So, have an established relationship with God. The next bullet, always seek God diligently. Always seek God diligently. This can be tricky sometimes. Because there are those distractions floating around. Those water molecules, you know, hunting season, good sales on Black Friday, traveling, Cedar Point. There, there are things, not saying that those things are bad, but when we get out of the routine of seeking God, we have to be careful because we don't want to become a habit. Does right. that make sense? Yeah. You following me? Always seeking God diligently, chewing on that roast beef that's in the scripture. Okay, chewing on that roast beef that we're reading or we're praying. Always seeking God. And then ultimately, it will lead to this. You will have an impact. You will be the salt. So, from this, this little mini-series that we've done, ultimately, what we need to do is have an affinity for God. If you remember that one definition of affinity, a similarity of characteristics suggesting a relationship. Especially a resemblance in structure. How do you get to know someone by drawing close to them? So ultimately, what we need to do is make sure that we are drawing close to God. Amen. We need to make sure we're drawing close and allowing His Holy Spirit to work within us, exposing. I think of the confession that our sister just made, you know, and she's allowing the Holy Spirit to do that. Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to do it in our own lives? Would you stand with me as we get ready to close? Let us have an impact on the world around us. Let us be that salt. Let us be that salt. But in order to be that salt, in order to have an effect, we need to make sure that God has all of us. We need to make sure that there's nothing that is keeping us, that, that we need to make sure there's nothing that's distracting the relationship we have with Him. And so in closing, I want us to just kind of do a quick self-examination, quick self-check. If there's something that you see that you need to like give to God, is that if there's something that you need to um, ask for forgiveness for, the altars are open. 
And I invite you to come forward. But we need to be seeking God diligently. You bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we come for you this morning. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your mercy, your loving kindness. Father, we thank you for the example of Daniel in the Bible. Father, how he had this distraction come up. Father, where most people would just cower and give in. But Father, he stood firm. And he sought you. He sought you earnestly. He sought you diligently. Father, I pray the same would be in our lives. Father, I pray that you give us that hunger that we've never had. Father, I just ask that you be with us and that you just help us to examine ourselves. And if there be anything that we need to surrender to you or give to you, Father, I pray that you would just help us to do that. Father, we can come to this altar that's open or, or we can do it even at the pews. Father, I just ask that you would have your perfect way in our lives. Help us to be that salt. Help us to have that effect on individuals around us, that we can be a living witness. As King Darius was able to see in Daniel's life, he recognized you. Father, may other people recognize you in our lives. We're no different, but it's you living within us having your perfect way in our lives. Father, we praise you and we thank you. Father, I ask that you just go with us and that you put a hedge of protection around us. And Father, that flame that's going on in our body, that you would just, that you would just fan it and that it would be a blaze, that it can be a light in the darkness, that we can be a witness to the world around us, that they would sense a different spirit within us. Oh God, we thank you and we praise you for who you are and for what you have done in our lives. We owe all to you, God. We give all glory and honor and praise to you. All these things we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.